Designed for ground support, the A-10 Warthog is simple and rugged. But in the Persian Gulf, commanders send Warthog pilots against the most lethal threats in modern war. I don't know if scared's the right word, but uh, certainly living in a state of, uh, of higher awareness, if you will. January 19th, 1991. Two days after the air assault against Iraq is launched, Saddam Hussein rains down Scud missiles on Tel Aviv. It is part of an effort by the dictator to incite Israel into entering the war. Panic is widespread. Many fear that the Iraqi Scuds will carry biological or chemical warheads. The prospect of poison gas being used against a nation born of the Holocaust is too much to bear. But if the Israelis enter the conflict, the Arab states united against Iraq will pull out of the war, and the threadbare U.S.-led coalition will fall apart. The entire Scud crisis was something that drove politicians crazy. It drove planners crazy. The missile is not a greatly accurate missile. Uh, it's kind of like a V-2 from World War II that the Germans built. Not much different than that, really. But the uh, potential terror capability of this weapon demanded we go get them. But unfortunately, there were many, many uh, cardboard tubes out there painted that looked like scuds. Well, are you going to send a $60 million airplane against something that might be really just uh, nothing but the garbage? That was the problem. Instead, the Air Force sends the $1.5 million Fairchild Republic A-10. Called the Warthog, this mean, ugly plane has long been the brunt of jokes throughout the service. With a top speed of 375 knots, the Hog is very slow. Supersonic fighter jocks like to say that the A-10's airspeed indicator is a calendar and that the aircraft takes bird strikes in the rear. But compared to modern fighter jets, it is an incredibly rugged machine. Just one thirtieth the cost of an F-16, the Warthog can absorb fire that would bring down a squadron of Falcons. When pilots climb into the cockpit, they are surrounded by a titanium bathtub that in early tests withstood direct hits from 57 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. The Hog's twin tail serves to mask the infrared signature of the engines and provides great low speed control. It is the consummate close air support weapon. The Hog's two GE TF-34 engines are mounted above the wing so that when taxiing on primitive runways, they do not suck up rocks or dirt. External to the fuselage, they are built so that if one is hit, it can burn, fall off, and the hog will still fly. The aircraft is built around a vicious 30 millimeter cannon that fires depleted uranium rounds able to penetrate enemy armor from up to two miles away. Hog pilots are trained to cater to the needs of ground troops. They are the closest thing the Air Force has to GIs in a cockpit. And in recent years, Army leaders have made clear their desire to command the Warthog as their own. fascinated by high-tech fly-by-wire technology, the Warthog has always been the bastard child. In fact, 
When General Horner's own son chooses to fly hogs, his father claims that the boy has died of brain damage. Just months prior to Desert Storm, the A-10 was headed for the chopping block in the Arizona desert. Matter of fact, uh, it had to be shoved down the Air Force's throat to some degree. When the A-10 was proposed, the Air Force really didn't want it because it wasn't a gimmick box that you could stuff all these goodies into. The Air Force likes the high-tech option, and they like complex gear. The A-10 is certainly not complex. It's a simple, straight, easy to fly, rugged airplane. Despite their questionable status, when the crisis in the Gulf breaks out, hogs are some of the first U.S. warplanes ready and able to head to Saudi Arabia. Squadrons of A-10s are rushed from Europe and America to the kingdom's northern desert strips. If Iraqi troops push on from Kuwait towards the Saudi oil fields, the hogs will be sacrificed until additional forces can be rushed to the theater. As we parked, I remember popping my canopy, and I immediately got hit with a blast of hot air. So I start looking around, trying to figure out whose jet wash, you know, who had their airplane uh, parked and was blowing their uh, exhaust over my cockpit. And uh, I couldn't find anybody. That was just the, uh, the wind and the heat. Wow. You may be wondering what this compound is here, and it just happens to be uh, our temporary home till we can get a really nice tent. As summer gives way to fall, it becomes apparent that the Iraqis are content with defending occupied Kuwait. For the next six months, nearly 200 Warthog pilots will make a home in the Saudi desert. One of these men, Major Scott Hill of the 353rd Fighter Squadron, will create a video diary of their experiences there. I hope they're real toilets. They're not, they're the holes in the floor. Oh no, there's a real one. Initially, no beds or furniture or anything like that associated with it, but as time went on, and not too much time, we ended up with bunk beds in there, and everybody went to the task of building their own furniture out of building materials they could find laying around. Now, are these shelves or are those shelves? Those are shelves. Check it out. Homemade shelves. This is just like a mash. Hey, man, this is just great. There's Spud, man. You see the beach outside? We have a, we have a beach here, right there. Yeah, a wall. Hey, look. This is a live special report from AP Network News, Crisis in the Gulf. The deadline passes. We view this situation with the utmost gravity. Uh, we remain committed to take whatever steps are necessary to defend our long-standing vital interests uh, in the Gulf. Nearly half a year after the 353rd's arrival, the deadline set for Iraqi troops to leave Kuwait finally comes to pass. The Americans stationed in the Gulf now realize that war is inevitable. Early on, they are told that unlike Vietnam, there will be no rotation home. They are in for the duration. Some spend the final hours taking one last look at video messages from their families. Most of us stayed up the night before the war and either wrote a letter home and I wrote one that I sent home, uh, one to my parents and one to my family and, and then I also wrote another one that I kept in my, uh, in my footlocker there in, in case I didn't come back from a mission and it was just more or less instructions as to you know how I wanted things to happen if I wasn't going to come home from the desert. Yes. Billy Fowl. Liberation of Kuwait has begun. <laughs> yes. On January 17th, the air assault is launched. Everybody and their brother was coming to this one area because they were heard that there was armor out the ass, and there was. And the initial strike includes over 750 Allied planes. At first, warthogs are limited to attacking Iraqi radar sites along the border. When I 
But by the second day of war, Saddam Hussein embarks on his Scud terror campaign, and the hog's role changes dramatically. Seven Scuds landed in Israel. Yeah. They but they weren't chemicals. They, were chemicals. they said small bombs, maybe seven inches. As Iraqi missiles fall indiscriminately on Tel Aviv, Israeli patience evaporates. Within hours, IAF F-15s stand ready to strike Iraq. They will have to pass over Saudi or Jordanian airspace, and if they do, the Allied coalition will fall to pieces. Well, at the time, we thought they were very close. As I recall, there was one night when they had their planes ready to go, and they asked us to get permission from the Saudis for them to overfly Saudi airspace, uh, which the Saudis were not at all interested in doing. We really didn't want them over there either. It is decided that the ugliest bird in the fleet will take on the Scuds. In this task, her slowness will be an asset. On average, an F-16 can spend just 15 minutes TOT, or time over target, in searching for the enemy missile sites. The low, slow, and fuel-efficient Warthog can loiter for more than an hour. And although it is a job for which A-10 pilots have never trained, years spent learning to distinguish real targets from decoys will play perfectly into the Scud hunting mission. Listen, guy, I gotta have a talk with my travel agent. This is not what I had arranged. It was an unusual mission, but for an A-10 guy, it was really kind of neat because I knew exactly where the target was. I even had some photographs of that target. Uh, and they told me exactly what to shoot. I was able to pre-plan the mission and actually decide how I was going to execute that mission before I ever walked out the door. With Vietnam 20 years in the past, most American aviators are young and new to combat. I'll have to go to work. Our jets were parked in uh, close proximity to the squadron building where we did all our briefings. And I've got to admit, that was probably the longest walk I've ever taken from the uh, front door of the squadron all the way up to my airplane. I don't know if scared's the right word, but uh, certainly living in a state of, uh, of higher awareness, if you will, because you felt every eye on you, every crew chief on the line looking at you, and you really felt uncomfortable thinking, oh my gosh, here we really go. I always had asked myself, hey, am I ready for that? And the answer you always get back is, yeah, sure am and now it's put up or shut up time. And once I strapped in and started running through my pre-flight checks, etc., then it was back to road again. Before the war, the plane was destined for the scrap heap. Now, it sets out on one of the most important missions of the conflict. This Air Force stepchild does not carry the infrared guidance pods and other navigational systems that more favored aircraft have. Instead, pilots fly with a map on their laps and navigate according to the roads and wadis below. Intelligence photos and data are rare to non-existent. I know one particular guy that was uh, sitting in what we call hot pit, or the ICT, uh, the integrated combat turn, getting the bombs loaded up. And the intel officer climbs up a ladder, shows him uh, a huge scale map, a one to two million map, a little red dot on it and says, see that? It says. Yeah, he says, that's where you're going. Okay. They set out on northwest flight paths in their stick and rudder aircraft, some 30 planes in all. They will search for the 20-foot missiles hidden somewhere in 300,000 square miles of desert below. The A-10 was built to hunt Warsaw packed tanks. Warthog pilots were trained to fly low and to avoid radar detection using the cover of the hills and valleys of Central Europe. But over Iraq, the textbook is discarded. Flying over flat, trackless desert means no cover at all. Instead, hog drivers fly high to avoid ground fire 
while being ever watchful for Soviet-made SAM missiles. But the aircraft is far from helpless. In the Great Scud Hunt, the Warthog packs one of the biggest punches of any ground attack aircraft in history, the Gao 8 30 millimeter Gatling gun. Very, very nice shot. We love the gun. There's never been an A-10 driver that just didn't get a big smile on his face when he knew he had a lot of rounds to shoot. It's a very, very viable uh, weapon system, and it works for virtually any target. It can take out anything from hardened armor and tanks to tearing up an artillery pit to strafing a command post to just taking out a convoy of trucks. Here we have your 30 millimeter gun system. System consists of a drum assembly, which stores the ammunition, a drive assembly that would be located approximately between the two units, and your gun assembly. The entire system holds up to 1,174 rounds of ammunition. Firing rate for the gun is 3,900 shots per minute, which equivalates to 65 shots per second. If the pilot had to at any one time hold the trigger, he would have approximately 18 seconds worth of firepower. But at which time the barrels would melt. The Gow 8 gun was really a kind of a philosophical extension of the 30 millimeter cannon in World War II, the, particularly those that were hung on Ju 87 Stukas in the uh, German campaign in Russia. Uh, but that gun was built to kill tanks. That was the idea. And the gun is extremely effective with a depleted uranium round. It truly can melt a tank. Being made of depleted uranium means that the foot-long 30 millimeter rounds are much denser than the steel armor of the tanks they are built to penetrate. The lessons learned out of those previous wars where we hung guns on airplanes were applied to putting a gun inside. And as a result, the, uh, the, the gun is aimed by the pilot just pointing the airplane. You can, as one pilot said, point it like a, like a garden hose. You just push the trigger and all of a sudden the, the ammunition is coming out and you, you uh, move the stick and you can do whatever you want with it. It doesn't require a very fine sighting system because the gun itself becomes the sighting system. So the idea was to put the pilot straight on the center line of the gun, put his eyeball right in the middle, and then he just gets in the middle of the fight and hoses whatever he can find. The gun will be used against scuds, SAM missile sights, and armor. With a hard sight similar to that used on a hunting rifle, the GAO-8 can shoot much further than pilots can see. Still, those with keen eyes can kill enemy tanks at over a mile, and armored cars from more than two. In the mission to destroy Iraqi scuds, however, both gun and aircraft prove nearly useless. Despite claims of success by American commanders, claims meant to placate the Israelis and keep them out of the war, the enemy missiles were almost impossible to find. It turned out it was very hard to find those launchers in the desert, the mobile launchers that they used to fire at Israel and Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's no evidence at this point. We haven't been able to confirm that we actually killed any mobile scud launchers. We thought at the time we had, but going back and reviewing the evidence now, there's some serious question about whether or not we ever actually knocked out any scuds on the ground. Military commanders and pilots alike expressed certainty that the mobile scuds had been hit. Pentagon reviews now show that this was not the case. Most of Iraq's 30 hard launch sites were destroyed in the first few days of war. But these were really just decoys meant to divert air assaults away from the enemy's true threat. The problem was that the Iraqis never intended to use these stationary sites. They had mobile scud launchers that could scoot out into the desert, fire their missile, and then hide somewhere, perhaps under a highway culvert or some other place, making very difficult to target. 
Does this mean the pilots lied? Does it mean Schwarzkopf lied when he told us, as he did during his press conferences, that Scuds had been killed? I don't think so. What I think happened was these pilots were going up. They were doing a lot of these operations at night. They were seeing vehicles in their infrared scopes, and they were killing them. And they were probably fuel trucks from Jordan. Whether the Scuds were hit or not is immaterial. You know, all you have to do is get the enemy to think you're going to hit them and you start moving them. Just the idea of hunting scuds uh, kept them ineffective. The rate of scud firings on Israel decreases dramatically, and soon after the scud hunt begins, Israeli forces stand down. The A-10s can take much of the credit for this, and with the Warthog's help, the coalition holds together. Eventually, I think they came to recognize the wisdom of not responding. It was a very hard thing to do. It was a courageous decision on their part, I think. It was the right decision. But you can imagine if the United States were attacked to uh, make a decision, have a government make a decision, that they would not retaliate. A very hard thing to do, but it was the right answer. Despite the ferocity of early airstrikes, a crucial set of enemy targets remains, Iraqi surface-to-air missile sites. These Soviet-made systems are state-of-the-art, but early on, wild weasel F-4Gs using harm anti-radiation missiles and cluster bombs destroy them with lethal regularity. After the first week of war, Iraqi gunners learned to strobe their radars, hoping to get a quick fix and shot on Allied aircraft without being detected. Air Force leaders soon turned to a less sophisticated means of eliminating enemy SAM sites the trained eyes of warthog pilots. These men, men well versed in spotting ground targets without the aid of sophisticated technology, are put to work in the Wild Weasel mission. We certainly could carry some good weapons to attack SAMs, but uh, we're really uh, uh, surprised, it's probably an understatement, we're surprised when they started tasking us to, to take out surface air missile sites. The Weasel mission, going after SAM sites, is one of the most feared missions in the Air Force, there's no doubt. Guys who do it are highly motivated. Um, you're looking down the throat of the, the fiercest threat the enemy has to put against you, a surface-to-air missile. Uh, you're going to have to go down the throat of this missile's envelope and disable the radar so that he can't fire back at you. And he also can't fire at the strike force, that's the whole idea, to kill the radar site so the SAM is ineffective. Thus, the wart weasel is born. Hogs do not pull SAM duty alone. Every A-10 strike force is accompanied by F-4G wild weasels, trailing not far behind. The warthogs fly low and root out enemy SAM sites with Mavericks and Mark 82 bombs. Should the Iraqis attempt to turn on their radar sights to track the hogs, the F-4Gs will blast them with harm anti-radiation missiles. Despite this effective teaming of Phantom and Warthog, surface-to-air missiles are the most frightening threat any pilot can encounter. They were always called flying telephone poles, okay. and they almost looked like a Saturn V launch. You could acquire them from quite a ways off once you were looking in the right direction. And it, it looked like they were launching a spaceship at you. Right away, your first move is to find it and then to get your nose headed downhill so you can go ahead and build up airspeed. And this has its pluses and minuses. One, you're getting a lot of airspeed 
But at the same time this is all going on, I'm watching the AAA erupting below me. Okay, that initially at the beginning of this engagement, I'm above its effective range. It's really not a threat to me. But what this missile is doing is driving me down closer and closer to this AAA range. So it's going to become effective and a significant factor here soon. And I don't want to say it's fear that, uh, that you really start thinking about, but it's almost like, yes, why me? Uh, Mitch was there, too. <laughs> Mule is the Sam ace today. He had five of them shot at him. <laughs> Buffooned my way over top of SA-2 sites. <laughs> but sometimes the Sams find their mark. And early on, a 353rd hog driver performing the search and rescue role is forced to save a downed Navy pilot from certain capture. All bunch of vehicles. Deep in enemy territory and nearly out of fuel, Captain Paul Johnson blasts a truckload of Iraqis that had closed to just 100 yards of the stricken American. We did the first combat rescue in the hall today. We grabbed an F-14 front seater. Slate 4-6. Went out last night. I don't know how deep we went, I'll have to look. We grabbed him with a couple of people, helicopters, and brought him out. The nine-hour rescue mission earns Johnson one of the two Air Force crosses awarded in the conflict. But just days later, Johnson himself winds up on the wrong end of an Iraqi surface-to-air missile. Many say he is one of the best pilots to ever fly the hog, yet he becomes obsessed with knocking out an enemy radar site, despite dense cloud cover that makes his TV-guided maverick useless. I'd been there too long. The weather was interfering. It, it was past time to throw in the towel and go home. But my fangs had come out. I'd driven my fangs through the floorboard, you know, grown one eyebrow and said, Hua, I'm going to go kill this thing. And I decide, my last feeble attempt, I'm going to roll down the chute, take it down, a load of Mark 82 500-pounders, pull off, and then we'll go home. And uh, a couple of things happen on the attack. Is I roll in on the bomb run with the my number two man, uh, calls blind. In other words, he can't see me. He's lost sight of me. And I miss that radio call. Had I heard that radio call, the answer would have been, I'm aborting the attack, I come off dry, because I am going down into the threat envelope and nobody's looking at me. Suddenly, what feels like a sledgehammer uh, just hammers my wing, and the airplane hard rolls to the right. Oh, ah! One's hit! One's hit! I'm yelling in the intercom that one's hit, one's hit. Then I finally key the mic and decide to tell everybody else. One's hit! One's hit! I look out my wing and see a gaping hole, uh, a lot of skin ripped off the top of the wing. I can see my entire main tire uh, is visible to me, which is a bad thing. I, I usually don't need to see that. Does anyone need assistance? You bet I do. What do you need? I'm westbound. I need a vector the shortest way across Whit, the who still has not found me, comes screaming down below the weather to get sight of me. Copy that. Keep cover on the ground threats. We'll have to penetrate some bad airspace. The A-10 is triple redundant. This means that if the main hydraulic system goes down, it is backed up by another. If the secondary system fails, the pilot can turn to manual reversion, where the hog's cable and pulley system kicks in. Manual reversion saves Paul Johnson's life, enabling him to nurse his wounded hog back to the Saudi border. In the Air Force, in emergency situations, we talk about the pucker factor. And um, 664 in the fleet, uh, she still bears the scars and the fang marks all over the cockpit, but the seat cushion has yet to be found uh, because my pucker factor was so high that particular day. Johnson can also thank his life to the Warthog's sturdy turbofan jets. When his wing was hit, 664's right engine swallowed an incredible amount of shrapnel and debris. But by design, it was able to spit the wreckage out, power back up, and bring him home. The entire airplane is a piece of armor. 
it is a flying tank. You can shoot the leading edges of the wings off or blow sections of wing off or a fuselage and the airplane still flies. It almost harks back to the World War II idea of the B-17 and uh, the P-47, which were very rugged airplanes and, and tended to fly home all shot up and still bring the crews home. Obviously, this guy made it back okay. Uh, yeah, he hobbled back. I'm sure he had a... Uh... I'm sure he had to clean his flight suit out because he took, he took a very severe hit. Yeah. yeah. The next day, a lot of guys were coming up to me in, in the hooch or in the squad and said, oh, PJ, did you sleep okay last night? Uh, PJ, were you laying awake last night? And on reflection, I got to thinking about it. I said, no, actually, I slept quite well, thank you. you know, I, I, said, uh, I said my prayer one at the end of the day and thank the Lord for taking care of me and recognize that we revalidated uh, an old concept and an old term from years and years ago when uh, the eighth air force and the bombers and the fighters used to talk about coming home on a wing in a prayer and i, I think that was applicable in my case I, we brought her home on a wing in a prayer Dogs take off and head into combat every seven minutes for the duration of the war. They are universally feared by the Iraqis. Above 5,000 feet, the plane's quiet turbofans cannot be heard, and at night, the olive drab paint scheme is nearly impossible to see. In the end, these simple machines prove stealthy in their own right. One of the advantages of this high bypass ducted fan engine is that this engine is real quiet when it's running in comparison especially like if you're on a bombing run when you come in to do your bombing run if you pull your throttles back to part power you're going to reduce even more thrust and more noise and you're just going to glide in once you hit your bombing target you could power up and thrust out uh, quiet approach and who cares how much noise you produce on the way out because you've already killed them you got the, uh, the buildings the chicken barn. they sweep in silently from more than a mile away, the Gatling gun rips enemy columns apart, suddenly and without warning. Because they were slated for retirement, warthogs in the Gulf do not carry the FLIR pods that enable other aircraft to operate at night. Warthog pilots come up with an ingenious solution. The Mavericks, slung on their wings, are guided by infrared television cameras mounted in the missile's nose. A-10 crewmen use the Maverick to convey this infrared image to a tiny TV screen in the cockpit. With this, hog drivers too can see at night. Compared to something that everybody would understand, it's, it's kind of like if you took a, a, a soda straw and looked through it and tried to drive down the road, you know, with your other eye closed. With the Maverick and its ad hoc sighting system, Iraqis moving under the cover of darkness find no haven from prowling A-10s. Okay, we got people running. People running. Roger that. We didn't know there were people in there until we started looking at our films, and we could see them jumping over the berms after the first missile blew up. So these guys who had thought they had protection of hiding at night, actually it became their worst enemy. They are running out of their vehicles to take them. Yeah, I know all those guys had families and kids and brothers and sisters and all, but uh, the way I look at it, he's shooting at me and I'm shooting at him and I was just the lucky one. And that's, you know, that's not for a, a soldier or an airman to decide. We just go with our marching orders and do what we're told to do. When you were out there fighting, you were fighting a vehicle as opposed to the people in the vehicle. Uh, when I saw a tank, I, I've got to admit I didn't think for a, a New York second about the tank crew inside. I thought about, hey, there's a tank, and uh, there goes a tank. By February 24th, D-Day arrives. Allied ground forces launch a ferocious assault on the dug-in remnants of Iraq's vaunted army. Most feared is enemy artillery. 
Iraqi guns are deadly accurate and have longer range than coalition gun batteries. They soon become the A-10's primary target and meet the same fate dealt to hundreds of Iraqi tank crews. When the remnants of enemy armor attempt to flee, the slaughter is remarkable. The Iraqis were caught on the open. It was like flicking on a light in a kitchen with a bunch of cockroaches. They were pounded from the air for days. Now, warthog drivers settled into the deck-hugging job for which they first trained, close air support. With the lives of American GIs and Marines at risk, all altitude restrictions are removed, and A-10s streak in as low as 100 feet to aid the troops below. For a typical day for us, it was, uh, you'd take off and fly three sorties, you'd go back to the base, uh, refuel, rearm, come back out, back to the base, refuel, rearm, come back out. You'd work your 12 to 14 hour a day and you can go sleep and then you get up the next day and do the same thing again. Plan, fly, eat and sleep and that was about all we, we did for six weeks straight. Made for a long day but uh, it really put a lot of iron and a lot of firepower out there on the target. A lot of, a lot of sorties were, were uh, flown. A-10 pilots learn to fly, as we say, in the weeds, undetected by radar or by the eyeball or by the ear. Uh, surprise becomes a terrific capability, and that was the idea. over the battlefield for nearly two hours as commanders repeatedly call upon them to dive onto enemy forces. And when they do, hog pilots often use a trick as old as combat aviation itself. A tactic all fighter pilots have used since World War I is coming out of the sun. Matter of fact, the, uh, the catchphrase in World War II was beware the hunt in the sun. And the idea is that you use the sun as a backdrop and it blinds the guy you're shooting at, whether he's in the air or whether he's on the ground. This World War I tactic can counter a very modern threat. Coming out of the sun not only blinds enemy gunners, it also provides an ideal heat source to draw Iraqi heat-seeking missiles away from their intended target. But the sun over the Gulf would soon be eclipsed. As American ground forces press home their assault, Saddam Hussein takes one last desperate stab at denying them air cover. By February 26th, over 300 Kuwaiti oil wells burn out of control. The oil fires in Kuwait, quite frankly, were a, a pretty smart military option. When uh, Saddam Hussein set them on fire, he knew that these fires, and particularly the smoke, would interfere with a lot of what the A-10 and other airplanes could do. You just can't see through smoke. High tech isn't going to get you through it. Infrared isn't going to get you through it. Good electro-optics and radar isn't going to get you through it. And the A-10, if nothing else, could fly low enough and around a lot of this smoke to overcome some of it. So it was probably a better airplane in the environment than most of the, uh, the higher altitude airplanes. A-10 pilots run the gauntlet beneath the dark clouds of smoke, and Saddam's environmental disaster does little to stem the tide. 100 hours into the ground war, it is nearly over. The battered survivors of Iraq's army flee for home. Most of those who stand their ground do so for the sole purpose of surrendering as quickly as possible to advancing coalition troops. The really surprising part of all of it was these Iraqi vehicles, some of the ones we had shot or were shooting, had been evacuated, had been vacated. Uh, because as I employ on one particular tank and I pull off and I am employing self-protection flares out of my airplane, so these uh, small flares are popping out of my airplane about once every three seconds, 
and Whit, my wingman, who is several thousand feet behind me, but looking at me and covering me, says, hey, PG, I think you're dropping flares on their heads. And I look down, and here in the middle of the desert, probably two or 300 yards away from any vehicle of any kind, is probably, I don't know, 50 to 100 Iraqis standing out in the middle of the desert, looking up at my airplane with their hands up, trying to surrender my airplane. As the ceasefire approaches, the tempo of American air assaults becomes brutally intense. It was really just a turkey shoot because those guys were running away and we just pick a vehicle that was trying to get away and shoot a Maverick or drop a bomb or strafe it and uh, try and take it out uh, just to, to destroy as much equipment as we could. Despite its proven ability, the warthog is still headed to the slaughterhouse. It is unlikely that any A-10s will survive the Air Force's ongoing trend toward high-tech weaponry. The airplane fulfills a low-tech requirement that now is not going to be replaced. We are replacing A-10s with F-16s. Many people think this is a big mistake. Can the F-16 do the job? You can hang some pods on the airplane, you can do the things, but the F-16 is a fragile airplane compared to an A-10. The A-10 idea was to get in close with a gun and let the pilot decide what he's going to shoot and use his brain more than the computer. The low-tech end of war will never disappear. You'll always have to confront the guy on the ground with a rifle or a tank or a truck or an artillery piece. And the A-10 does this marvelously. The war is over today, and I'm going home tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is, uh, all of you are always welcome in my home, wherever that may be. And uh, I want you to know I'm going to be praying for all you guys to get home real soon. And uh, I'm going to continue to pray for Sif and, uh, and for Sweetness until they're back with us. But one A-10 pilot of the 353rd would not be coming home. As Rob Sweet and other American POWs are released, the Iraqis relay news that Sif, Captain Steve Phyllis, was killed in action on February 15th, his warthog knocked out of the sky by an Iraqi surface-to-air missile. live together for seven months you're gonna get pretty close with people and then when you go through the experience of losing somebody in our case temporarily losing sweetness Rob Sweet the PO, our POW and then uh, losing Sif who was killed in action uh, that's difficult as well uh, and, and that also draws a squadron together to go through something like that uh, it, it's kind of a harsh reminder that in the middle of this this techno war that people want to call it uh, there, there was a human cost. Certainly it wasn't as costly as other places we've been, but uh, there was a cost, and it was a very personal cost. Uh, and to come back and remember that we didn't bring everybody home. We did not come home with everybody we left with. The flight into Myrtle Beach was, was awesome. Uh, we got on the ground. And there was just people just lying in the roads, and we got the land, pull in, ran through a, a sprinkler system. They had the, their big fire trucks. They had blue water in it. That was our, our squadron color. 
You know, so we were pretty choked up getting out and our families running over and getting big hugs from our kids, which we hadn't seen in the whole seven months. And it was good to be home. Coming up next, fly some of the fastest military aircraft around, examine the fighter on Air Power Showdown. Then we rely on it for our good days and our bad ones. More than just the forecast, take a scientific look at weather on Discover Magazine.